Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Awesome. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> you know, sometimes that is the prayer, right? God, just let me get there. And I amen when he does. So we like to start our Sunday services by saying welcome to anybody that is here in our sanctuary for the first time. If you're joining us for the first time, awesome. Or if you're joining us online for the first time, we want to say welcome. We're so glad you guys are here to worship with us today. I am Pastor Nathan, and this morning we're going to be learning about walking with God in the midst of a godless culture. That doesn't apply to us today, does it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, as we've been studying through Genesis, we just finished uh, last time uh, our look at Genesis 4, which was a record of human degeneration. Um, that chapter started first with Cain's murder of his brother Abel, and we saw in that story how even in the midst of that sin, um, God, I believe, gave an opportunity for Cain to repent. But unfortunately, Cain just uh, stood firm in his uh, rebellion, uh, lied to God about his his part in it, and so God ended up cursing Cain. And that curse carried down through his line because then we looked at the account of growing degeneration amongst mankind in Cain's descendants, ultimately uh, capping with his descendant Lamech and his kids, Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal Cain, who were the, the fathers of agribusiness and the arts and technology. And we looked at that story where Lamech ends up giving us this thing called the sword song where he boasts about his extreme violence, where he boasts about killing a young man because that man just, you know, wounded him slightly. And really it was a picture of the degradation of morality in Cain's line. That Lamech would boast that his violence was much more than his famous ancestor, Cain. And so, but even in the midst of that, we saw that God allowed advances in civilization as Lamech's three sons, I said, were the father of, of agribusiness and arts and technology. They pushed the, the, the envelope of the development of civilization, even though they were a sinful line. And you know, it just shows us a picture that despite the advances of civil, civilization, despite the things we discover, despite all of it, it has nothing to do with our morality. That our mortal soul is one that is born in, into sin. We are born with the nature of sin. And mankind with his own discoveries and advances is never going to solve the problem of his sinful and fallen heart. And, and that's simply just true um, through all ages. That no matter what mankind invents or comes up with, it does not change the moral issue of the heart. And instead, the advances of mankind are often used to further pursue sin and debauchery. And so, it was a very bleak picture of the development of mankind there, but it's not without hope. Because at the very end of chapter 4, we saw that the contrast to the degrading line of Cain and the great sin and violence that his line was known for came the line of Seth. And the line of Seth was a line of people who recognized their need for God, who recognized and understood that there is ultimate salvation in no one and nothing else, that it was God and God alone who was the important one. And so that line, the Bible tells us, began to be known for calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, chapter 5 is then going to give us the genealogy of Seth. Now, it is a list of names. And some people go, how interesting can that be? I promise you it's very interesting as we get to it, and I'll show you that later, but the line of Seth is a line that ultimately ends up with Moses and ultimately ends up with Jesus Christ, God himself being born in the flesh. Now, here in Genesis 5, it's going to take us from Adam all the way up to Noah, who is the last patriarch before the great flood that wiped out all of humanity except for Noah and his family. And so Seth's line, as we look at it today, it's very, very different than the line of Cain. See, in Cain's genealogy, it's just the names. There's no mention of how long they lived. There's no mention of when their firstborn was born. There's, there's none of the details like that that are included in Seth's line. And I believe because Cain's line was not meant to be eternally remembered in, in any way but the bad way, that it was the cursed line. It was the line of the curse down from Cain, and it was ultimately the line that was wiped out in the flood. But in Seth's genealogy, we see the ages of each patriarch at the time of the birth of their firstborn. We see the number of years they lived after that birth. We see the total number of years they lived upon the earth. 
And what we see in contrast to Lamech in Cain's line is what walking with God looks like in a man named Enoch. But first, we're going to praise God and worship him. Because as God's people made in the image of God, who know God, who've received salvation in God, we're so thankful. We just want to praise him, right? He is almighty. He is everything. And despite our failures and despite our sins and mistakes, God's promises stand, don't they? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you, God, that, that today, Lord, we get to celebrate communion as the body of Christ, Lord, to remember what you did for us, how, Lord, you came and you died on the cross. Your body was, was given to, to suffer the full wrath of God for us, and then your blood was shed, establishing a new covenant of faith, that we would be able to walk with you because it's not based upon our strength and our effort, but it's based upon your spirit and your power. So God, as we look at Genesis 5 and we look at the line of Seth, Lord, may we be encouraged, God, that, Lord, despite what mankind does evilly, if that's even a real word, Lord, but, God, that you would work through and still have your promises come to fruition, God, as we see in Seth's line that your promise and your blessing on mankind was carried through. And, Lord, may we be encouraged to know that we can walk with you, God, despite the sin in our flesh, despite the challenges of our culture, that, God, we are able to walk with you because you are God. You are who you say you are, and therefore everything you say is true and faithful. Your promises are true and faithful, Lord. And as your people, we trust in nothing else but you for everything. We love you. We praise you, God. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right, guys, we are in Genesis chapter 5 this morning, and we're going to be covering the entire chapter but in the first couple verses of this chapter where we're introduced to the Sethite genealogy, it takes us all the way back to Adam. But these first two verses start out by reminding us about a very, very important aspect of the creation of mankind. Specifically, that we are all made in the image of God or the likeness of God. And so read with me in verse 1. It says, this is the document containing the family records of Adam. On the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. When they were created, he blessed them and called them mankind. So these opening verses to this genealogy are, are meant to remind the readers, the original readers, and us today that the fall of mankind didn't destroy the image of God that we were created in, right? Oftentimes when, when we stumble into sin, we, we go, oh, I'm a terrible Christian, and I can't be a Christian. And of course, the devil is right there, right? Shame on you. You call yourself a Christian. How dare you? You don't represent God. And that's a lie from the devil, right? We don't want to sin, but when we do, it doesn't destroy the image of God that we were created in. And so we're being reminded here of that very thing. It takes us all the way back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, where it says, he created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And so the reminder of these opening two verses in this chapter is, is reminding us that not only are we the image bearers of God, but because we are the image bearers of God, we have an incredible potential. And we have an incredible calling. As image bearers of God, we have the capability as, as, as humans to hear God's word, to understand God's word, and to apply God's word. That is a very, very high privilege that we have. Nothing else in all of creation except angels can hear God's word, understand God's word, and then live according to God's word. The animal kingdom can hear it maybe, it doesn't understand the teachings and the morality of it. Plants don't. Nothing else in God's creation has this privilege that we have because we are made in the image of God. Now, also as image bearers of God, we were commissioned to rule over the earth on behalf of God. And as image bearers, what that meant is that we as humanity, we as, as people, God's special creation, we have the possibility of having an intimate relationship with our creator, that we would know him and that he would know us. It is a very special and beautiful thing. And so 
when we're reminded that the image of God was not destroyed by Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, that the image of God was not destroyed by the fall, we're also reminded here that neither was the blessing that God pronounced upon humanity. In these verses, it tells us when they were created, he blessed them. We can't forget that we are blessed by God. Now, in this genealogy, as we're about to go through it, this phrase, this, this, this reminder that he blessed them was meant to bring us back to, again, the creation and really the context of the blessing. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it says, God blessed them, and then he said to them, start your career and become a CEO. <laughs> Climb the corporate ladder. Have the biggest house, the nicest car, right? Does it say any of that? No, it says, what was the blessing that God laid on humanity? It was be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth. Humans do a lot of things. We do a lot of things. We have a lot of goals and a lot of purposes, but, but really the, the original image of, of what mankind was blessed to do was as image bearers of God, to come together as one flesh, procreate, creating more image bearers of God, and then raising them to know God and to worship him and to praise him. And then the next generation would do the same thing and the same thing. And on and on as God's creation, his special creation, mankind covered the entire earth, ruled over it on behalf of him, and that was the intent. That is the, the real high calling that God has placed on man. It's one of the reasons, incidentally, I believe Satan has worked so hard, especially in our modern culture, to diminish parenthood and to diminish motherhood and to, no, don't have kids. And, no, no, that's going to ruin your life and kids are going to mess you up. And it, it, it was really the, the pinnacle of God's blessing. Now, this doesn't mean having a career is bad or, you know, having a nice car is bad. None of that's bad. We, those are good things. But to diminish what God blessed us specifically to do and to be, to raise up people who know and love and worship God, um, that shouldn't be diminished. And so here in these verse two verses, we're reminded, we're reminded of what God had commissioned mankind to do, and the genealogy of Genesis 5 shows us that they did exactly that. The Sethite Leiden did exactly that. Um, it also suggests that they did it quite well, right? <laughs> Massive multiplication, as we'll look at. And what we see here in, in these verses is that as each generation birthed a son, that's what this generosity tells us, this person birthed this person, and then it also says, and other sons and daughters, right? That phrase follows each patriarch through this genealogy, and so what we're seeing here is that the patriarchs in Seth's line are living, actively living out God's blessing upon their lives, multiplying, spreading the image of God throughout humanity, and being people who called on the name of the Lord. See, that's the difference from Cain's line in chapter 4. Chapter 4, we saw Cain defy God's order and start building cities as when he was supposed to be a nomadic wanderer. We see Lamech, the seventh generation from Adam, boasting that his violence, his, his just murderous intent was greater than his famous ancestor Cain's. But here in Seth's line, it told, told us at the end of chapter 4 that Seth's line is when people started to call upon the name of the Lord. And so that's what we're going to see through the line here. Now, I'm going to read the whole chapter, okay, and then we'll come back to the parts that I want to focus on. So, but pay attention to phrases that repeat, all right, that's what I want you to pay attention to. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. Adam was 130 years old when he fathered a son in his likeness. There's that image passing on, right? According to his image and named him Seth. Adam lived 800 years after he fathered Seth, and he fathered other sons and daughters. So Adam's life lasted 930 years, then he died. Seth was 105 years old when he fathered Enosh. Seth lived 807 years after he fathered Enosh, and he fathered other sons and daughters. So Seth's life lasted 912 years, then he died. Enosh was 90 years old when he fathered Canaan. Enosh lived 815 years after he fathered Canaan, and he fathered other sons and daughters. So Enosh's life lasted 905 years, then he died. Canaan was 70 years old when he fathered Mah Mahalalel. Kenan lived 840 years after he fathered Mahalalel, and he fathered other sons and daughters. 
So Ken, Kenan's life lasted 910 years, then he died. Mahalalel was 65 years old when he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived 830 years after he fathered Jared, and he fathered other sons and daughters. So Mahalalel's life lasted 895 years, then he died. Enoch, or Jared was 162 years old when he fathered Enoch. Jared lived 800 years after he fathered Enoch, and he fathered other sons and daughters. So Jared's life lasted 962 years, then he died. Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah. After he fathered Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters. So Enoch's life lasted 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was not there because God took him. Methuselah was 187 years old when he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived 782 years after he fathered Lamech, and he fathered other sons and daughters. So Methuselah's life lasted 969 years, then he died. Lamech was 182 years old when he fathered a son, and he named him Noah, saying, this one will bring us relief from the agonizing labor of our hands caused by the ground that the Lord has cursed. Lamech lived 595 years after he fathered Noah, and he fathered other sons and daughters. So Lamech's life lasted 777 years, then he died. Noah was 500 years old, and he fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So did you guys notice repeating phrases through that chapter? Yeah, there's a few here. Now, you can imagine um, after all these years of multiplying, right? Because the years listed here for their lifespans, they're not metaphorical. They're real years. They're, they're, they're 969, 365-day years, right? It, it's, it's real time that's being recorded here. And people go, well, how did mankind live that long back then? Well, we're that close to creation, right? The earth is still good. Um, you know, all the, all the pollution and chemicals and corruption of sin and all that is, is just barely in the beginning here. And so I think it was easy for man to live a long time. I mean, if we didn't have all the stuff today that wrecks our body, um, and on top of that, God reduced the lifespan as we got past the flood, I think we would live a long time. In fact, in the original design in the garden, weren't we meant to live forever? Yeah, so, so think with all those hundreds of years of multiplying, probably thousands, thousands of offspring, all who passed on or received the likeness of God, the image of God as their parents came together as one flesh and gave birth to their children and on and on and on. Now, these people in Seth's line were all people who, despite the fall and despite sin, were people that could hear God's word, were people that could rule and subdue the earth, that people who could have relationship with God, and that's the picture we see in this line. Now, surely not every single person in Seth's line um, followed the Lord perfectly. Some probably didn't, you know, because when you look at Cain's line, you're like, well, weren't they procreating, and weren't they? (laughs) Yes, the image of God was going through their line too, but the focus, the contrast between the two chapters really highlight Um, what took place as those lines developed. And as we've talked about before, Cain's line degenerated into just ever-increasing sinfulness. But we're going to see something different here in Seth's line. Now, despite the encouraging picture, right, that God's blessing them and they're multiplying, and wow, look look at how God's promise is still going through this line, because again, this is the line that ultimately Jesus Christ, the Savior, comes from. Um, there was still a depressing reminder of the results of the garden. Did you guys hear it mentioned over and over and over? This person gave birth to this person, and then they lived this many years after, and so the total of their years were this many. They gave birth to other sons and daughters, and then they died. And then they died. And then they died. And then they died, right? Except Enoch. Now, it's been that way since the fall. We weren't supposed to die but we sinned against God. We disobeyed him. In an instant, our spirits died, our spiritual connection to God, and then the, the, the decay of creation began. And so then humanity would start to physically die as well. And, you know, death is a present reality for all of us. You know, the, the, the most sure statistic in, in all statistics ever created, right? 10 out of 10 people will die. None of us are going to make it out of here. Now, of course, we look through the Bible and we're like, well, some did. But that's 
rare movements of God. For the most part, we are going to face death one day. Now, all of us, all of us have a day before us, should the Lord not return yet, that our time here will be over, that the life we live here will be over, that the things we're accomplishing and doing here on this, this earth will be over and we will not be able to accomplish anything else here. Now, there's a lot of people um, that, that, that have told stories or witnessed that when, when someone's at the threshold of death, oftentimes as they're reflecting back on their entire life, it could seem like that. It could seem like such a short amount of time. And then what happens is people close to death or on their deathbed are like, where did my life go? And, and what happened? It, it seems like yesterday I was doing that. Two seconds ago I was doing that. And, this, you know, and that's an idea um, or something that people experience with their, when they're on their deathbed. It even happens as people are getting older and aging, right? When we start to reflect on, oh, I wanted to do this, or I had that goal, or this and that, and as time marches forward, we wonder what happened. Yes, I'm gonna be 50 years old in a couple weeks, and it's like, you know, that is, that is half a century. Now, of course, I've had some uh, um, lovely uh, congregants here that, that are older than me and go, you're just a kid still, you know? So, but I don't feel like a kid still, right? Or at least my body doesn't feel like a kid still, you know? And I'm like, you know, two seconds ago, I was snowboarding and playing paintball and starting businesses. And now I, I, I pull my calf getting up from a chair, right? And it's like, what happened? And I reflect back on my life and I feel like it's gone so fast. But when I look back to, well, when did this happen? I realize, gosh, that's, there's been a lot of time. And then I look forward in the future, and I'm like, that's going to come fast, too. And pretty, so, pretty soon, well, Nathan was not there because he went to be with the Lord, right? And we don't look forward to that type of thing. We all have things we want to accomplish. And, and you know, again, many people that when they're, when they're at the end of life and on their deathbed, sometimes they have a lot of regrets. I should have done more of this. I should have done more of that, less of this, you know? I should have spent more time with my family and less building my, my business. I should have spent more time with my kids and less at the office, right? I should have spent more time with my, my spouse than, you know, and those types of things people will voice at the end and, you know, I think even with the peace of knowing God, you know, sometimes Christians could, could have regrets about what they maybe didn't get to do, you know? Even though we're like, I can go into heaven and it's great, as they're approaching that, they're like, oh, but, you know, a lot of young people, I used to do young adults ministry, and I, I would hear a common theme amongst young people. They're like, God's coming back, heaven, awesome, but can you wait till I get married? I really want to get married. I, I really want to start my family. Like, God, hold on, God. I mean, yes, yes, I want nothing more than to be with you, but, but, but I want to do this first, Right? And then, you know, some people, have they, as they miss those things, they'll, they'll even have regrets, you know? Now, I think for a believer, the closer you get to the end, and I've witnessed this over and over, the more the believer who has a piece of Jesus Christ is simply like, I can't wait to get there. <laughs> you know, I'm done with this nonsense. Take me home, Lord, you know? And God takes us in his time according to his will and his plan. But as we see here in this generational uh, story of Seth's line, as each generation of patriarchs came and went you know, the, the, the excitement of life, the bright hopes and dreams eventually all came to an end as the predictable dark cloud of death descended on all of them. But right in the middle of this, right? Right in the middle of then he died, then he died, then he died, we come to the seventh generation after Adam, a man named Enoch. Now, this is not Cain's son, Enoch, in, in chapter four. This is a different Enoch, a different man of a different line with a different heart and different spirit altogether. Now, in three short verses, this almost depressing story that death is ever present, in three short verses, Enoch's story shines a, a bright light on that, on that rhythm of death in mankind. Now, Enoch's place in the genealogy is also very, very interesting because if you count from Adam in Cain's genealogy and Seth's genealogy, you'll notice that Enoch is the seventh generation from Adam. In Enoch, or in Cain's line, Lamech, the evil dude, was the seventh generation from Adam. Now, I don't believe anybody was having kids and going, okay, uh, hey, you know, seven generations now, make sure you name him Enoch because we want to create this contrast. I think God created the contrast for us to learn from. 
That is, you take the seventh generation in both lines, the evil line and the godly line, and you line up Enoch against Lamech. It just creates an eternal contrast of the choice, the choice mankind has, that it's going to be heaven or hell. It's going to be death or life. It's going to be despair or hope. And so I believe God orchestrated this, that we would learn from Enoch's life and choose what is right and good. And so look, look again with me at verse 21. It says, Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah. And after he fathered Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters. So Enoch's life lasted 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and then he was not there because God took him. See, as you read through this genealogy, that the detail of how long he lived should stick out to you right away. Everybody's living hundreds of years, like 900 years, 900 years. And then you get to Enoch, and it says he only lived 365 like the people that were older than him there were going, 365, you're still a kid, right? But the detail is here, so we go, whoa, what, what, what is it about this man's life that's different? And so it tells us that he walked with God. It's specifically telling us that, right? It doesn't say that about all the others in the line specifically, but it stops here to say, in contrast to this man who is boasting about even greater violence and murder than his ancestor Cain, in contrast to that, we had a guy in the Sethite line who was walking with God. Now you might think, okay, yeah, walk with God. I, I know what that means. Well, do you? We're gonna look at that right now because this phrase that he walked with God is only used of two people in the Old Testament, Enoch and Noah. Now, it's a, it's a special phrase. It doesn't just mean walking with God. It, it's referring to the closest, deepest, most in, in, intimate personal communion with God. It's, it's the picture as if you're walking with him on the same path side by side, but you're the little kid reaching up and holding his hand. And he, the father, is just walking along with you. That's the picture of this, this beautiful, just innocence and purity of, of childlike faith, right? Childlike faith is a beautiful thing. Childlike faith doesn't doubt. Childlike faith doesn't, you know, like, wait, what a second. There, there must be an explanation. But they're just like wowed by things, right? Like my grandson James, you know, we do things in his life or playing with him and stuff, and, and it makes sounds and noises, and he's just like, oh, you're a magician, Right? And it's just, he's, he's, he's innocent. It's just that childlike faith. Everything is new and fresh and exciting. And of course, you know, as the older we get, we start to get cynical and all these things. And walking with God is walking with him in that childlike faith. There's, there's, there's not a whole lot of argument and debate. It's just like, you're dad. You can do anything. Like anybody picks on me, I'm going to say, I'm going to tell my dad, and I have absolute faith and confidence that my dad's going to kick your butt, right? That's, that's that kind of faith that kids have. And so um, it's different from other Old Testament phrases because as you read through the Old Testament and you see other godly men or godly people that were referenced, you'll see phrases like they walked before God or they walked after God, Right? But you only see in Enoch and Noah that they walked with God. Now, those other phrases are, are referring to blameless moral and eth ethical behavior, right? They, they walked before God, right? They were being obedient. They walked after God. They were following his precepts in, in their behavior. But walking with God is something very specially, uniquely intimate, very intimate. And it, it indicates that, that deepest commitment and dependence and faith and trust and again, like I said, it's that idea of continuing the same direction with him, not on your own, but holding his hands. How many of you remember that poem, Footsteps, right? I just thought of it now, so I don't remember the whole thing, but yeah, you know, God, I looked back, and there was only one set of footprints. What's up with that? Why did you leave me? I didn't leave you. That was when I was carrying you, right? And so... What walking with God looked like in Enoch's life, we get details of it through the New Testament, especially in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, it tells us this. By faith, Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. So it tells us some things about there about what his walk with God was like. One, it was by faith. It was by faith. 
And we're going to see in the next verse, Hebrews 11.6, what that's defined as. But, but he had faith. He walked with God by faith. And then it tells us that he was um, pro- approved as one who pleased God. So he had a pleasing faith to the Lord. And you go, well, what does a pleasing faith look like? Verse 6 of Hebrews 11. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must have believed that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, contextually, this is tied to Enoch. So what we can presume about Enoch's pleasing faith is that it had these two major characteristics, that his faith was such that he lived in a way that demonstrated he believed that God exists and that he believed that God rewards those who seek him. Now, that idea of believing that he exists is, yeah, I I believe he's real, right? I believe God is real, but it also means that I believe he is who he says he is, that I believe his words, that I believe his promises, and I believe his warnings, and I believe them to such a degree that my life is changed and transformed by those beliefs, And so the idea here is this Enoch who was made in the likeness of God, who was able to hear God's word, and he responded to God's word, believed that God was real in all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. Where do we hear that? In the New Testament. That God is who he says he is, and it says this pleased God. It pleased God then, it pleases God today. You see, when God's people simply, completely believe in him, What his word says about him, God is pleased by that. You see, I think it bums God out sometimes when we say, I believe you, God, I believe in your promises. And then we face a situation that's difficult and we instantly start going, oh no, is God here? Is God with me? I think that bums him out. Because he's like, you you, you say you believe me, but then when you get into the difficult situation, now you're doubting me? Like, do do you really believe if you're having that, you know? And it's a weakness of our flesh. It's a real challenge in in our life that that we want to trust God, to have that faith in him, in who he is and what he's done, and just, that's true, right? I mean, how how many of you believe in gravity? Do any of you doubt gravity? Right? Is anybody like, "Eh, yeah, I mean, I've read about it in science and I learned it in school, and you know, I believe it's there because nothing flies off the earth. Um, but do any of you find yourself going on top of a tall building and going, well, maybe if I jump off, I'll fly? Kids do that. Childlike faith. But the reality is, is for us, the point is, is, is we believe that gravity exists so much that you don't see any of us jumping off of tall things. It's not a question in our mind. We don't ponder that. We're just like, no, that's that's reality. Therefore, I don't jump off of tall things. You live in according to the belief, right? Well, do you do that with all of God's promises in his word? Do you do that with all of God's warnings in his word? Right? This is the idea of, of Enoch's faith. And then faith, and then that pleasing faith, it says that they must believe that he rewards those who seek him. That's really believing in his promises. That because Jesus died for me and I put my faith in him, I am going to heaven. Not I might. Not maybe. I am. Because the Holy Spirit lives within me, I have the ability to to say no to the temptations that come at me. Not I might have the ability. I do. Now, whether we use it or not, different Bible study, okay? Okay. But sometimes people are like, hey, can you, can you pray that God would give me strength? And, and that's a good prayer, but the thought hit me one day where I was like, do you believe that God lives within you? Yes. Do you believe God created the universe out of nothing? Yes. Is there any more strength he can give you? No. So the prayer should be, God, help me use the strength you've already given me. Right? Right? It's a subtle shift in ideology, but it's there. And so, now, when it says that Enoch's faith, he believed that he rewards those who seek him, it also implies that he believed the opposite of that, right? That he judges those who reject them and continue to go their own way. How do we know that? Well, in Jude, verse 14 and 15, it tells us this about Enoch. 
Now it says, it was about these that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied. Now, these he's talking about in Jude prior to verse 14, he's talking about apostates. He's talking about people that say, oh, yeah, no, I, think, I believe in God, but they, but they change it. They don't rely on it. They do their own thing. They live their own way, which was probably very common in Enoch's day. This is what he prophesied. This is what Enoch was preaching in his 365 years or 300 years after Methuselah. Look. The Lord comes with tens of thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly concerning all the ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way and concerning all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against him. Now to to quote the character of, of Ray Comfort, the great evangelist, do you see there God, Enoch saying, hey, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Now, God does love us, and God does have a plan for our life, and his plan is wonderful. But so often we want to soften the the truth of the gospel and not preach sin and not warn people that a holy, righteous judgment is coming on those who reject Jesus. We don't want to do any of that because, wow, that, that creates conflict. And yet this man Enoch, who God says was approved as one who pleased God, who lived his life by faith, described as walking with God, the only quote we have that he ever said in his life of ministry was a warning of judgment on those who reject God, a warning of judgment on those who are ungodly. Now, you don't just preach that either because God is love and you want to tell people that he's made a way. But you can't leave out the fact that if you reject God, even if you say, oh yeah, I know God, but you're living your own way constantly and consistently, you're in danger because God is gonna judge those who aren't saved. And so what this tells me about Enoch is, is that he had full belief in who God was, his character, full belief in the fact that God is perfectly fair and perfectly impartial and perfectly right in all of his decisions. If God said, this is bad, Enoch wasn't going, well, God, I mean, come on, some people, and you don't know how they were raised. And he's just like, no, God said it was bad, it's bad. So I'm going to warn people, hey, if you're doing that, that, that's not a good thing. You know what? You need to give your life over to the Lord because he did, the, you know, and all that stuff. Enoch believed that God will indeed reward those who seek him and judge those who don't. And so the picture we get of this walk with God is one of a man named Enoch who, who was completely saturated with God. His whole life was just defined by his relationship with God. His decisions were, were guided by God's will and what God wanted. He didn't, he didn't have this ongoing, well, God, I say I love you, but I'm gonna live this way. It was just, I'm, I'm sure he wasn't a perfect man. None of us are. But just like many imperfect people throughout the Bible, especially in Hebrews chapter 11, we don't see God focusing on what they did wrong. We see them focus, God focusing on the fact that they had faith in Jesus Christ. They had faith in God. They had faith in the one who would save them. And so Enoch's walk was rooted down in, in this deepest intimacy he had with God. The idea is that he knew God. And God knew him. He knew God. He knew God's character. He knew God's will. He knew what God wanted from his life. He knew what God wanted him to do, how he wanted him to live. And then God knew him because he gave himself fully over to his Lord. What he was doing in his walk with God and what a walk with God looks like is he believed God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. He had great faith in the Lord, and because of his great faith in God and his promises and his truths, it caused him to not only live a life that was pleasing to God, but then also to preach the righteousness of God and the the judgment of God. You see, this wasn't just a season of Enoch's life, right? It doesn't tell us here that, hey, Enoch lived 365 years, and you, you know what? Between year 282 and 283, man, he had a thriving ministry. It tells us in the verses about Enoch that at 65, he gave birth to Methuselah. And then it says, after that, he walked with God for 300 years. What that tells us is that for three centuries of his life, 
he continually daily pursued God, sought the Lord, tried to live a life pleasing to him, tried to tell people about him and warn those who reject him for three centuries. Can you imagine that? Now, I know a lot of us, you know, we'll, we'll, like, we'll do great ministry for a month. Then we're like, whew, I'm, I'm worn out. I'm going to back off. You know, I, I passed out 10 tracks this month. Whoa, man, I'm done. Now, again, passing out 10 tracks is great. Please do that, right? But we'll find ourselves backing off of ministry sometimes because maybe we're in a difficult season of life. Maybe, you know, there, there's, there's other things we need to attend to, or maybe we're just lazy, and we back off, and we say, well, I'm a Christian, but that's it. I don't need to serve. I know the church keeps announcing that they need volunteers, but I'm good. I know the, you know, and we just, oh, no, it's just me and my faith, and that's it. And as we read through the whole New Testament, our faith was never meant to be about us and us alone. We're a part of a community. We're a part of family. We're a part of a kingdom. And that kingdom is at war with the kingdom of this world. And we're all called to be a part of that battle. Now again, as Enoch was living and depending on God, pursuing the Lord for three centuries, every day progressively getting closer and closer to him, he was doing it by faith. He wasn't doing it because Enoch was great. He was doing it by faith. That tells us that there was this daily moment to moment like, God, I can't, please help. God, I'm weak, please help. God, I, 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 I can't say no to my sin. Please help. Right? That's, that's the walk of faith. And then after three centuries of that, one day at the age of 365 years, still a young man in light of uh, the days he lived in, it says in verse 24 of Genesis 5 that he was not there because God took him. And before you go, well, what does that mean? Hebrews told us, right? It means he didn't die. He didn't experience death. Now, we can only speculate how God did this, right? It doesn't tell us, and I don't think it's an important detail. But there are other examples in Scripture when, when God took Elijah. It was in a chariot of, of horses, right, of, of fire and whirlwind. And you're like, ooh, that's exciting. And then it might be just maybe he vanished because that's how the Bible describes the rapture, that in a twinkling of the eye, we'll just be caught up to be with the Lord in the air. The only thing we know for sure is that his, his wonderful walk with God went straight from living this life for God to poof, eternity forever with God. Just how awesome was that, right? He didn't experience physical death. Mom. <laughs> All right, back to the study. Enoch didn't experience physical death, right? He was exempted by God from the law of death, the law of decay, the corruption that, that would lead to this physical body dying. He was exempted from that. Instead of experiencing that, right? Instead of experiencing the, the age and the slowing down and instead of experiencing all that stuff that was part of that, he was just changed in a moment. Now, why does God include this Bible or include this in the Bible? Why, why is it here in this genealogy of Seth? Because I believe Enoch's example to his contemporaries, his example to the people of his day, was a great encouragement and a consolation for those. You see, at the time, right, there's these, these two lines of civilization developing. This line over here is evil and sinful, but man, they're coming up with all these great inventions of civilization. And then you have this other line over here that, that maybe was doing some of that too, but what they were known for is calling upon the name of the Lord. And then God says, look, look as these generations went on, horrible violence. And look over here, this man who believed in God, believed in his promises, and then experienced the promise right in the middle of his life. He believed, and he was a testimony to all the people of his time that God does indeed reward those who seek him. And because that's true, it also means he will judge those who reject him. He was translated up into eternal life with God. That's just too cool. And I believe it happened, and it's recorded, to encourage and awaken the hope of life after death in humanity. You see, 
Every human today and every human that has ever lived has the choice. Reject God, accept God. Do it your own way, do it God's way. And what the Bible tells us over and over is man has tried and tried and tried to do it his own way, to make up his own religions, to create his own moral code, to do every, and over and over and over again, nothing changes in the degenerate heart of man. And then you have in this other line, the same exact thing except people who said, God, I have faith in you. And in that line eventually came the savior of the world. And then, and today, we're told, you have faith in him, you're saved. It's not by your own works. It's not by anything you've done. It's simply by the grace of God. But all that forgiveness, all that grace, all that mercy is given through faith. I believe you, God. I believe you are God, that you exist. And I believe you're the rewarder of those who seek you. And by extension, I believe that you're going to judge those who reject you. So God, please forgive me of my sin. Now, if you look at the timeline of the Sethite genealogy of his pick that's going to go up on the screen, hopefully you can read it. This is a, a, a graph of the ages of all the patriarchs. And some of you have seen this before, but if you haven't, you're, you're going to be intrigued. What you see there is that middle red line is, is that God took Enoch at just over halfway from creation to the flood, right? Now, again, these, these years that the patriarchs lived, these are, these are real years. So... Enoch was taken. Now, every patriarch before Enoch, except Adam, was still alive when Enoch was taken. You get that? Seth, the direct offspring of Adam and Eve, was still alive for another 55 years. It's very possible that in Enoch's early life, he got to sit down with Adam and go, great, 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 Adam, Grandpa Adam. What was it like to walk with God in the garden? What, what was it like to be there with him? And I, I'm just speculating here, but I imagine Adam going, oh man. <laughs> Let me tell you, because I've never forgotten it because we lost it. And it has been hard ever since. Wow. But God made a promise and he gave us a prophecy and, and he's, he's gonna fix it. And Enoch, wow. I believe that. I believe that. See, Enoch's dad lived for 597 years after Enoch was taken. All these patriarchs, except for Adam, of course, and then Noah, who was born 69 years after Enoch was taken, they, they all had hundreds of years to ponder Enoch's translation to talk about it, to share the story, to, wow, what was his life like? What did he do? And, oh, yeah, he was just taken. People possibly right there that say, I saw it, or I didn't see it because he was there and the not there. And in hundreds of years of talking about this truth that it happened, that you know that stuff where we're always being told that, that God is gonna fix it, and, and there's an afterlife, and there's a paradise with God if you live for him, and just, Enoch went straight there. Imagine how encouraged they were as they faithfully awaited their own reward for following God. To see God one day again. To know that this physical death was not the end. And this great hope, I believe, surely led to many calling upon the name of the Lord in his time and the time before the flood. Now, by the time the flood came, obviously, we're going to read that the degeneration continued. And it's going to continue to the place where the only man who is faithful on the earth is Noah. Noah. Noah's dad prophesied, hey, he's going to be the one that's going to, going to bring some relief. Now, this hope that those who walk with God will see God as their reward, um, it was voiced by many great men in the Old Testament. You know, we see it in people like Job. Job chapter 19, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives. Many people think the book of Job was actually a story of Job pre-flood. We don't know that for sure, but think about it. If, if Job was alive pre-flood, and we're hearing this, this, these words from Job where he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. It could possibly be because he'd heard about the story of Enoch. Speculation. But he goes on to say at the end, he will stand on the dust. 
Even after my skin has been destroyed, yet I will see God in my flesh. I will see him myself. My eyes will look at him and not as a stranger. My heart longs within me. Job believed in the reality that I can have a relationship with God. God can know me and I can know him. Daniel chapter 12, he says, many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to disgrace and eternal contempt. Those who have insight will shine like the bright expanse of the heaven and those who lead, lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Even years later, even though Enoch didn't die and he was translated, the hope that the message that when you die, if you know God, you're gonna be with him forever, that hope still existed in Daniel's time. And the reality that all who die are gonna go somewhere. You're either gonna go the path of the Sethite line or you're gonna go the path of Cain's line. And then in that judgment of the flood, that's Cain's line was completely wiped out. So this, of course, all foreshadows the New Testament promises of the promises that are hoped for by those who trust in Christ, right? Especially the promises that are written in 1 Thessalonians chapter four, the promises that we're told that when Christ returns for his church, that it says that those who are alive at that moment will be taken, caught up with the Lord, or caught up to the Lord in the clouds. We're looking forward to that. We're waiting for that day. And then right after that, in 1 Thessalonians 4.18, Paul writes, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Do you think people were being encouraged with the words about Enoch's translation? Do you think people were being encouraged by like, look, all this stuff we've heard down through the centuries at this point, it's real. Put faith in it, trust in it. I believe that Enoch's contemporaries were very comforted by his testimony, his life, his walk, and his reward. So we who bear the image of God, who have that passed to us through our natural birth, who are able to hear God's word and to understand God's word and apply God's word, well, we need to know that God's word is our foundation for everything, right? His word, front to back, is a promise that one day God will restore all that was lost in the fall. That's the hope of heaven that we carry. And really, it's like if we would just trust him and put our faith in him and his word and his faithfulness for our ultimate salvation. Trust in him and him alone, right? Now, we know that when the fall happened, it was prophesied to Eve that her seed would one day defeat Satan. And, and then it was also spoken through his people. What do I mean by that? Well, we all know that names have meaning, right? I once found a bookmark at Knott's Berry Farm and it said, Nathan, given of God. I was not a Christian at this time, so keep that in mind. I took that bookmark around knots the rest of that night, and I'd go up to girls and go, hey, I'm a gift of God. <laughs> it didn't work one single time. But names have meaning, all right? Names mean things. And so in Genesis 5, we have Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Those are the names in this generational list. Why did God include it all? Why didn't he just give us Enoch's story? Well, if we look at the meanings of all the names, this is what we see. Adam means man, okay? Seth can mean appointed or granted. Enosh means mortal. Kenan can mean sorrow or dwelling. Mahalalel means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch could mean teaching or dedicated. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means dedicated or despairing, sorry, despairing. Um, did I skip Enoch? Yeah, no, Enoch means teaching or dedicated. Lamech means despairing, and Noah means rest or comfort. Now, if you put those names in a list, in a left-hand column, and you put the meanings of their names on the right side, it actually gives you a prophecy. This is what the prophecy says. Go ahead and put it up on the screen. Man appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing rest. Isn't that awesome? Now, a few of those words had a second definition, right? And so I was like, well, what does it mean if we, if we use the, the other definition? And so this is, what it, this is how it reads with the, with the second definition of the words. Here's what's beautiful. 
the names of all these generations over hundreds of years, God, however inspired and spoke through the parents to name the kids, he even spoke to the ones that name the kids that have two definitions of words that aren't even the same, and it's still prophetic. This is what the second way says. Man granted mortal dwelling. That we lost our immortality and weren't killed for it, but God allowed us to continue living. The blessed God shall come down dedicated. That Jesus Christ was the sacrifice dedicated for our sin. His death shall bring the despairing rest. Even in the names of the people in Seth's line, you have God declaring the gospel, declaring his hope for mankind. And so it's in Christ, who is the blessed God who came down, that we find rest. Rest from guilt, rest from striving, rest from condemnation, and ultimate rest one day when we're absent from this body and face to face with God, walking with him hand in hand in heaven forever. For many, that'll come when these physical bodies perish, right? The Bible says to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. For some, for some it's gonna be when the Lord comes and you're still alive and you're raptured up in a twinkling of an eye. Your testimony will be, and they weren't there for they are now taken by God. But until then, we have a mission as the church to call on the name of the Lord, to be people who are known for that, to walk with God. We are his people in this earth that are called to have a deep, intimate, close, open, honest life, walk, a communion with him. To live in such a way that people go, whoa, you believe something radically different from the rest of us. What is it? To walk side by side with him in this world, holding his hand, reaching up to Papa and saying, hey, let me walk with you. Keep me safe. Completely at peace knowing that he is with you. Now the question is, is are you walking with God today? Are you walking with God today? You know, it's through Christ that we're able to know God intimately and personally. It's through Christ that the barrier of our sin is dealt with once and for all. Seeing Christ We see the Father, right? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When we see Christ and we read and study his life, we're seeing God, God himself. And when you see God in Christ pouring out his love for the world, pouring out his love for you, that's when you begin to understand. When you believe that he is God and that he died for you and paid the price for your sin, and, and you trust in his work to redeem you and to, to wash away your guilt. When you get to that place and do that, you know God. You know him. He already knew you. But you come to the place of knowing God. Your dead spirit is made alive again. And you're able to, to hear and not just hear the words, but comprehend and understand and apply and live according to. You have a completely different sense of things because your spirit is alive. And then when you, by faith, you receive Christ, you're you're receiving God. And by growing in Christ, your character becomes more like God. Hey, we're the likeness of God, right? We're the image of God. And then by being more and more God's likeness, we just walk closer and closer with him. And so today we're going to celebrate communion as a body because we're talking about this deep, close walk with God, this communion with him in every part of our life. And we celebrate communion because we are in communion with our creator. Jesus, God in the flesh, he told his disciples on the night before his crucifixion as they gathered upstairs for the Passover feast, which really was a feast for Israel to celebrate God delivered us from Egypt. As they were gathered there, he explained that the bread and the cup represented him. It represented him and what he was going to do for him or do for them and all who trust in him. Jesus was saying, I am the deliverer. I'm the one who delivers you from the power of sin. I'm the one that delivers you from the penalty of sin. I'm the one that gives you the hope of eternal life, not eternal judgment. He told them by the communion that he established that that he was the sacrifice and the atonement that would pay the price for them. He was the hope looked for ever since the beginning. So Jesus is the blessed God who came down to this earth and he taught us about God's heart 
and he taught us about God's will for us. And at his death, he was indeed dedicated as the atoning sacrifice. And through what he did, all the despairing will truly indeed find rest. It's in him that we find peace. It's in him that we find true hope for that eternal rest. And that's why we celebrate communion, because we never want to forget that. And so you guys should all have a communion cup here in your hands. If you've been here before, you know the instructions, but there's two tabs on the front. There's this really thin plastic tab. If you pull that back, it'll review the, reveal the cracker here on the top. And what this represents is the bread that Jesus took at this supper as he instituted this. It says that he took this bread and he broke it and he gave it to them. He said, this is my body, which is for you. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. What did he want us to remember? He wanted us to remember that walking with God isn't about earning his favor. It's not about a transactional relationship. Well, if I do this, God is happy with me. If I don't do this, God is mad at me. Walking with God is a matter of faith. His body was devastated for our sin. Like when you read through the Gospels, you read through the crucifixion, you see what he went through, being whipped, being nailed to the cross, disfigured by being punched in the face with a bat, all of that. He did that for you. Or to put it another way, you were supposed to go through that because you're the sinner. I'm the sinner. But he said, I'll take the, I'll take the wrath of God for you. What kind of amazing love is that? How could we ever earn God's favor? We're sinners through and through. We just simply have to have faith in who he is, to believe that he is God, that he exists, and to believe that he reward those, rewards those who diligently seek him. And when we simply trust and have faith in him and hold on to his hand, walk side by side with him and cling to him for everything, we find that our despair melts away. We find that, that all of that concern and worry just because we're holding the hand of our God, our creator, and our savior, and there is no other safest place to be. You can realize today that when you walk with him, that you gain hope, that you gain hope that one day through physical death or rapture, you will be taken from this place and stand face to face with God to walk with him forever. That's what we remember in the bread. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We praise your name. God, we know that that you gave yourself as the atoning sacrifice. Lord, that the, the full wrath of God against sin that, that should have fallen on us, Lord, you took in our place. That would be, we would be able to trust that your work paid the price for our sin. God, that we would be able to, through faith in that, know and believe in the promises that you have for us that we will one day be with you forever. And God, we're so thankful for that. Help us to never forget what you did for us by giving yourself on the cross. We thank you and we love you. Let's partake together. Now, if you have the cup, if you very delicately pull back the thicker tab, it'll reveal the, the juice here. And what this represents is in that last supper, there was a cup that they would pass around and Jesus took that cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. What did he want them to remember? Well, one of the things they would remember is from the very moment in the very beginning after Adam and Eve sinned, an animal was slain. Blood was shed to, to cover their sin. And mankind knew from that point forward that the penalty of sin was death. They knew that, just as God had said. And from the very earliest point in history, that truth was preached. And Enoch preached that truth. That if you don't have God as your savior, judgment will come. The only way to salvation is to trust in God and what he's done. If they would just trust their creator, it wouldn't be their blood shed for their sin, but the blood of someone else, the blood of another. 
And so in this part of communion, we remember that walking with God, it means grace, it means mercy, it means faith and trust. It's the remembrance that because he shed his blood for our sin, our, our, our fallen and hopeless condition is remedied. That as his blood was spilt, that was the payment, the final payment, you are forgiven forever if you trust in that. And that's it, just faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. We remember in this part of communion that because he hung up on the cross, through faith in him, we will one day be up in heaven with him forever. Father, we love you so much. We're so grateful you sent your son to die for us. God, we know in the, in the mystery of your trinity that you are three persons and yet one God. And that fa- the Father, Lord, you, you, were, you were pleased with the Son as he came to the earth to, to clothe himself in frail humanity, dedicated, appointed to be the sacrifice for all of mankind, to save us from this life of, of sorrow and, and mortal dwelling, that we could a- again be restored to the immortality and the eternal life of, of blessing and joy that we originally had with you. But God, you are a holy God. You are a pure and righteous God. And sin is so just defiling. The only way to atone for it was the shedding of blood. But God, the blood of animals, it was corrupted just like all of creation was corrupted by sin and so it only covered. But Lord, you came, took the wrath of our sin and then shed your perfect sinless blood And that blood washes us clean of the stain of our own sin. May we never forget that. That as we strive to be people who walk with you, we won't do it in our own effort, but we'll do it by faith. We'll trust and depend on you to help us do what we cannot do on our own. And that every time we're feeling tempted, we're feeling discouraged, we're feeling like the enemy is winning, that we would remember the blood of Jesus Christ. That when the enemy is condemning us because we messed up, we would remember the blood of Jesus Christ and know that we are forgiven because that's what your word says. Thank you, God, for loving us so much. Let's partake together. Well, I pray God would bless you guys. I hope that study of a genealogy was interesting. <laughs> And um, there's so many genealogies in the scripture and, and God even speaks to these things. So I encourage you to even read those in your devotional time. But, you know, Enoch was such a great example to all of us, not only of a man who walked with God, but that it's possible because he was a sinful person as well. We can walk with God. Trust in him. God sent the Holy Spirit to live within you. Why do you think he did that? It's a seal of the promise of salvation, yes, but the Bible tells us he's our comforter, he's our counselor, he's, he's all these things. Why? Why does he dwell within us? So that we could ask him for help. Say, God, I, I can't do it by myself. I need you to help me walk with you. And if you pray that prayer every single day, guess what? God's going to answer. God's going to give you strength and God's going to give you power. And each day you're going to progressively get closer and closer and closer to the Lord. Not perfect, you're not going to be perfect until you get to heaven. But we don't focus on that, we focus on what we can be through the power of Jesus Christ, amen? All right, God bless you guys. Let's worship, church.